I'll ask to call on uh, stage Charles Hoskinson, who will also be joining us on the panel, CEO of IOHK, to give us his uh, remarks as well. I think the mic works. Hi, everybody. Yeah, okay, good. I'm a little tired, I apologize. We, I was out drinking last night with a Zulu guy. He's good. <laughs> I didn't win that fight. So when I was a child, I grew up in Hawaii. And one of my favorite things to do, huh? We'll go over here, huh? How about that? Oh, that's better. Hi, everybody. OK, there we go. OK, so when I was a child, I uh, grew up in Hawaii. I grew up on the island of Maui. And one of my favorite things to do was walk to the library. It was a great experience. I was about six years old, braving roads I probably shouldn't have braved, sometimes by myself. Uh, and uh, I loved to read the books. See, when I was growing up, we really didn't have internet access. It was an academic thing, a university thing. And just a few decades earlier, Vince Cerf and Bob Kahn were working on that protocol as a project that really had nothing to do about unifying the world. But then suddenly, a generation later, the cost of moving information went from something tangible, something real, where I had to walk to the library, to all of us instantly getting access to it. In a blink of the eye, we could send a communication to anyone anywhere in the world. In a blink of the eye, anyone anywhere in the world could learn anything they wanted to, permitting that it was in the web. So what this concept invited is a reimagining of some of the other institutions of society. So when we look at how governments work, how banks work, how commerce works, they tend to be paper-based and siloed in a certain respect. And they tend to focus around things like coordination and trust, identity, reputation, representation of value and the flow of value, these types of things. These are the core purposes of governments. And when the internet came out, we started asking questions like, why doesn't value move at the same speed as information? Why should it cost something to move money from one person to another? Why should it cost something to have a commodity turn into a stock or a stock turn into a bond on a market? These things should be instantaneous. These things should be fast. OK. So in the 80s and the 90s, there were many attempts to digitize such things, many attempts to represent such things. And the core problem of these attempts is that they were centralized. So while they could be very performant, and why could they work great and really well, at the end of the day, you'd be trading one master for another. Over the last 10 years, what we've witnessed is a tremendous revolution of thought, where people realize that we can get all the value that the internet has brought in terms of information for money, for value, for property, for identity, on a global basis but we don't need gatekeepers. We don't need to give anybody control. We don't need to elect a leader and say, your idea is the only idea. Rather, we, everybody, have equal access to deciding how are we going to trust each other? How are we going to coordinate together? This can be a voting system. It can be a property registration system, a business registry. It can be a, something as simple as I'm a coffee farmer in Ethiopia who's trying to find the fairest price at a washing station. It doesn't really matter the scale. It can be on a national scale, or it can be on an individual scale. And everyone, for the first time in human history, regardless of where they're born, where they come from, their knowledge, will have access to the same technological stacks. And these stacks are fundamentally permissionless. So I'd like to believe the purpose of this panel is to try to, to have a discussion about given that we have these new capabilities, given that these things are available to all of us, what will we do with them? How will we use these things for the good of everyone, not just for the good of some people, which is the way human history has traditionally worked? You'll hear a lot of terms like cryptocurrencies and blockchain, and to be frank, I couldn't care about them. I care much more about the social elements of things, because after all, money is just the collective delusion. So I'll close with a story. Has anyone heard of the island of Yap? Anyone? Oh, yeah, okay, we got some people. So there was a small island out in the ocean, 
where most islands are. And apparently they are famous for having the largest money humans ever created, giant stone rings. The island wasn't blessed with the stones to make these big rings. They actually had to go to a different island and carve them and then very dangerously transport these giant stone rings back to Yap. So how did you own them? Through oral traditions. People would say, all right, well, Bob owns the ring. I'm going to give it to him. And then maybe if he gives me some cow or you know, a house or a pig, I'll give it to Alice or something like that. Well, somewhere along the way, one of those stone rings sunk into the bottom of the ocean. And they said, well, you know, it's at the bottom of the ocean. Well, it still must be there, so let's just start assigning ownership to it. And that's really an amazing thing if you think about it. The, the whole point of these things is they're hard to make, they're hard to transport, and you can see them to verify them. And then suddenly, people in Yap were willing to accept the sea stone, and it became a very famous one. That was the one everybody wanted to own, even though they couldn't touch it or see it. It had a good reputation. So and in essence, it doesn't matter if you're talking about pieces of paper or pieces of metal or giant stones that you carve very bravely and hopefully somehow can get back home, or stones sitting at the bottom of the sea. Money, in a sense, is a social artifact. Value is a social artifact. So that means that everybody in this room collectively gets to decide how you wish to represent that. The point of the technology of our space is to give you the best tools, the most open tools, the most royalty-free tools that no one in the world gets to tell you how to use, no matter how much they want to or what they're going to benefit. So I look forward to the conversation. I thank the minister for coming. I thank the Rwandan government for uh, being so incredibly friendly my time here. Uh, and I'd also like to thank the people here. Uh, it's been an incredible experience. Uh, two days ago, I spoke at Impact Africa. There were people from 26 nations here. And the quality of questions I received was extraordinary. I spoke at MIT recently, and I got better questions here than I got at MIT. So thank you very much. Allow me to welcome on stage Dr. Monique and Sanza Baganwa, Deputy Governor, National Bank of Rwanda, kindly join us. Uh, Craig Stephen Wright, Chief Scientist and Chain, we've just had him speak. Immediately after the selfie, kindly join us on stage. Charles Hoskinson, is he still in the room? Kindly join us on stage. Tunde, Adipo, VP Partnerships for Stella, kindly join us on stage as well. And Thibault Verbius, the, the partner at uh, DS Advocates. I know I murdered the name, but kindly join us on stage as well. All right. So uh, let's get things started. I'll just reiterate what was mentioned at the top of uh, the session. The idea of an African currency was first proposed a long time ago at the same time as the idea of a united Africa. One century later, this conversation resurfaces uh, mainly by the fact that we've now engaged on a, a one trade area, an Africa free trade area, that we are still wondering how exactly we're going to trade at, uh, with the, the least amount of hindrance possible. So just that as the basis, I'll go and sit down and then we'll just hear from each of uh, the panelists where we are with uh, adoption and uh, uptake and what they think should be the next step. For some of the different uh, panelists, we'll ask a different conversation because they've already answered it in uh, their openings. So I'll start off uh, possibly here, being the, uh, the host. So we saw a post recently about blockchain and what Rwanda was trying to do to incorporate blockchain maybe into land solutions. But we're trying to move from that to the transaction base, which is Bitcoin. Before we get into that, we'd like to understand, as Rwanda has made strides on the same, we've had a conversation with the central bank governor, the minister of finance, and they said the room is open for negotiation for players to come, at least with the regulator involved, to adopt some of these new age technologies. Where are we as the regulator in terms of the conversation on Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies? Okay. Um, Could we turn
Thank the mic you. A bit. It's a little hard to hear. Is it on? Is it on? Can you hear? It's okay. I, I asked, where are we? <laughs> I, I really need to make sure all the panelists are on the same page because we'll, we might get lost in translation. Where are we with the adoption or conversation on cryptocurrencies? Oh, I think um, uh, as Rwanda, are you asking a question as Rwanda or yes, as generally Rwanda. as yeah. Rwanda? Oh, as Rwanda, uh, we welcome the technology DLT mm. um, because it stands um, opportunities to transform financial services, just like um, uh, mobile technology has been leveraged yeah, to improve digital payments and so on and so forth. Uh, however, well, we are saying uh, we have to, um, first of all, understand what are the risks and what are those opportunities, uh, make our communities appreciate um, what this uh, new technology is and the cryptocurrency that is really built on that technology right. is. Uh, we know that uh, so far uh, there is that anonymity around uh, the, 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 the same currencies that um, we have uh, to be aware of the risks uh, uh, from the anti-money laundering and the co combating financing terrorism uh, we have uh, to look at um, how do you protect the consumer if there is that anonymity behind who is the issue of this currency, should you have a problem, what does happen? So all those are issues we, we still have to, to assess and, and, um, and, and um, educate uh, the people. So far, they can really trade in those, but we are saying excess caution so mm -hmm. far because uh, as a central bank, we have not issued and we are, we, we, they don't have legal tender here in Rwanda, so we cannot really back you should anything uh, happen. But we, we, we know that as um, digital uh, evolution really is here to stay, uh, more better things are yet to come and we don't want really to miss the, the train. So we get ready, uh, we get our teams uh, ready at the central bank, but also at uh, the Ministry of ICT, for instance, and uh, the, the policymakers, uh, institutions that really are in this space, so that we can really learn what we have to do next. In the meantime, we have a blockchain, uh, I would say a sandbox um, a policy that is allowing um, uh, really people to test ideas in a, a safe environment, uh, live environment, and uh, we hope that as they come on board, there is that room also so for us to, to, to move forward with them yeah. as we continue to observe and understand better. Perfect, thank you. Um, so we, at least you've created context. Um, let's throw it now to the digital offerings and then we'll get to practicality, right? So the two gentlemen, at least the third end on the extreme end. Uh, Charles, I'll come to you. The idea of uh, an African cryptocurrency, uh, at least let me hear it from you because you're looking inside and you've worked in Ethiopia, you could give us your perspective on this. The idea of an African cryptocurrency beats the logic that was behind the cryptocurrency generation in the first place. We were supposed to have um, an element of equality, not African, not US, not Asian, none of that. So when we say an African cryptocurrency, we're still limiting, and we still don't see the elements or the modalities of the basis of any cryptocurrency being generated from the African perspective. We're still getting most of our ideas from outside, so how can we now say we have something generated from outside, designed in Africa, for the outside? Just give us your perspective on this. First off, can everybody hear me? Uh, the microphones are really low, so I'm having a hard time hearing. But, uh, it's pretty low. Okay, talk a little louder right into the mic. There we go, that's a little bit better. Okay, uh, first off, I'm not an expert on Africa. I, I grew up in Colorado and Hawaii, so I can tell you about horses and sugarcane, but I can't tell you much about Africa, which is why we actually have local partners. We, uh, we were just in Ethiopia and Addis Ababa, and we met with ministries and uh, we're hiring uh, local developers and uh, we're working with uh, a lot of startup uh, accelerators there, such as Blue Moon and others. So, speaking from a position of ignorance, in a cursory analysis, I think before we even talk about cryptocurrency use issuance or adoption, 
there are much more foundational things. There's kind of like a three-headed hydra that has to be slayed. The first is intermittent interact access. If you're talking about money that requires you to be online or at least occasionally connect, uh, it's probably a good idea to make sure that that's as universal as possible. Uh, second, there's the issue of computing infrastructure, whether it's a cell phone, a laptop, or, or something. If you're going to be storing private keys, signing transactions, uh, you know, you're going to be in charge of your own financial destiny, you have to have some sort of reliable computing device. And that's not ubiquitous yet. Uh, finally, there's the, the meta problem of knowledge. Uh, so there needs to be good systems in place to allow people to sort fact from fiction, and these systems need to be localized to the needs of each culture. So I think these are three barriers to adoption before anybody has a serious conversation about cryptocurrency adoption, which is why we generally don't advocate uh, cryptocurrencies at the moment in uh, the continent of Africa, and for that matter, for most of the world. The consumers just aren't ready for it. However, on the enterprise side, we feel that there's tremendous opportunity. Things like uh, voting systems, property ledgers, business registries, uh, these types of things are obvious problems for a lot of countries, and they have a mandate to solve them. And the underlying technology that makes things like Bitcoin good can be repurposed to try to resolve these types of issues. And that gets much more government buy-in, much more enterprise buy-in. And then invertly, it will gradually move its way into the consumer space. As another point, there is a huge financial incentive from some of the wealthiest companies in the world, such as Samsung and Apple and Facebook and others, to try to get cell phones that are internet connected in the hands of all people in the world because that's how they make money off of their products. So I think we have the same advantage Tesla has with batteries getting better every year because people need lighter, faster charging, cheaper batteries with, that we have with uh, the proliferation of internet infrastructure. So I think that three-headed hydra, two of the heads will probably naturally resolve themselves without any intervention over the next five to 10, maybe 15 years. Uh, it's on a country by country basis. As for the final one, I think the, the, the thing that governments ought to do, all regulators, all ministers, I highly encourage them to start with the education side of things. And there are many wonderful partners that they can bring on board, such as um, IC3 at Cornell. We have a research group at Edinburgh. Uh, and there are many others throughout the world who are neutral objective. They don't have a financial incentive to tell you one way or the other. And they're perfectly willing to actually create great content that ministries can distribute amongst their people to, at the very least, prevent their people from becoming victims of scams like OneCoin or BitConnect. All right. Perfect. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Charles. Um, Craig, now over to you. Um, I'd like to hear your view on um, contrasting statements so all over the world in regards to, we could touch now on Bitcoin as one of the cryptocurrencies. So on one hand, we had uh, JP Morgan, Jamie Demon, uh, Demon uh, say Bitcoin is a fraud. On the other hand, we had uh, Goldman Sachs and Barclays as uh, early as this week at um, cryptocurrency uh, trading desks. Um, with, uh, of course, Bitcoin as one of its major indices. On the other hand, we have uh, Bitcoin surfacing all over everyone's conversation in Africa, but we're also seeing people say that Bitcoin, originally meant as a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, electronic cash system, is not the best for emerging markets because the rate of transaction and the fees that come with it might not suffice what we are used to on the continent. So we need to hear what... I know you're not so keen on awareness that everyone just learns as they go, but we'd love to know what your journey has been trying to get us on board. So basically, um, all these things are out there by people who love to tell you what can't be done. Uh, most of them are wrong. There's a block cap that's being removed in Bitcoin Cash. That I think we need to hear you properly. <coughs> there we go. There's a block cap that's being removed. The electricity use, et cetera, is all to do with number of transactions per block. We remove that. We're funding a tera project, which is a terabyte block. Uh, that then gets us to 50 transactions per day per person on Earth, and we'll keep going further than that. Now, the reality is you don't need internet. There are ways of sending Bitcoin via SMS. In fact, there are other ways. Using a number of technologies we'll be uh, talking about in the next week at CoinGeek and things like that, we could even have uh, one-time uh, mnemonics. So people could securely go to someone else who has an SMS phone and transfer Bitcoin. And then it goes between their mnemon uh, mnemonics. Now, the reality is people say, well, this is bad, this is terrible, all the rest. JP Morgan said that 
before they went on a massive buying spree. After they said it, there was a 20, 25% dip, and JP Morgan bought it. So yay. Tell everyone how bad it is, wait for it uh, to crash, and then make profit. Uh, who's who's uh, defrauding who? Then we have uh, Warren Buffett, the guy who had to be bailed out in TARP because uh, if he didn't receive money from Obama, he would have been bankrupt, um, who's now rich again because he received government handouts, um, who has never invested in the internet because he thought that was a scam. We have um, a few Nobel Prize winning economists who said the internet is uh, worth less than fax machines, um, telling us how this won't be of value. Now, the reality is, it's not about all these silly schemes and whatever else about crypto kitties or, or anything like that. And in the coming years, we're going to show you just how much you can do on a system like Bitcoin. In fact, on Bitcoin. Not because people tell you it can't be, not because I want to raise money or do some ICO or do a pre-dump or anything like that, not because I want your investment. That simple. Because if we enable people to trade, one-to-one, -one, individual to individual, that is where the world changes. Not because we want a whole lot of people to follow and have dictated what happens, not because of old ideas, and US dollars, not legal tender, not in this country. Legal tender means something that you have to take by law. That's all that actually means. I've got a law degree, I'm doing my, uh, my Doctor of Law at the moment in uh, the UK, and I can tell you quite simply, legal tender means mandated, it means you have to take it. It doesn't mean you don't have to take it. It means you can take other things. And if people have value that they can use, that they will use something more, they will. That's why people here take US dollars, that's why they take pounds. That's why people actually smiled at me and actually preferred some of them, because you can say what you want, and you might not like that, but if you can trust the foreign currency because it goes up more, great. And over time, people are going to see this in crypto, not because of the uh, we can't trust it or whatever else, but because they can trade it more and more liquid, more globally. If you can trade from here with people in Texas, if you can do direct contracts that are secure, where you don't need to worry about trust issues anymore, where the money is only released on receipt. That changes things. That's where money's going. Not direct trade the way we have now, but full smart contracts that are simple. That's why we're starting to release SDKs. Not to sell, but giving them away. All right. So Thanks thank a lot. you. Thanks a lot, Craig. Uh, so we've had that perspective. Of course, we'll get a lot more. And I have a sense that uh, there's a lot of technical terms, and we, we just need to get back to the basics. How do you get a Bitcoin? How do you mine it? How, you tr how do you transact it? Uh, what's the applicability on the African scheme of things? Because, I mean, you've engaged, according to uh, sources, since 2009, since it was founded. But a lot of people are just encountering it, some in the room and some uh, possibly just the last couple of uh, days or weeks. So which brings us now to the issue on practicality and how it's applied. Um, Tunde, you'll allow me to come to you. Um, you've mentioned that um, as Stella, of course, it's an open source network, letting anyone build low cost financial products for the community. But this has been designed outside the African continent, right? So when you're trying to look at uh, designing solutions for Africa, first off, where are the low-hanging fruits? Where should we look at these cryptocurrencies targeting first? And how can the general public now tap into that as quickly and as practically or realistically as possible? Hello? Hello, can you hear me? Thank you for the question. Oh, I'm not sure. Thank you for the question. Um, you're correct. Stella is open source, and obviously we're a San Francisco-based company. But the platform allows you to actually build things on it. You can have your own tokens on the platform. So it allows you to actually customize things. Now, in terms of um, low-hanging fruits, I would say that um, payments is definitely a low-hanging fruit. If you look at the stats in terms of intra-Africa trade, 
it's about 13%, right? Africa is trading more with outside of Africa than within Africa, right? And in terms of what we should do, in terms of unity, there needs to be more trade within Africa. There needs to be a way in which I can pay somebody in Angola. There needs to be a way in which I can pay somebody in Liberia easily, right? So I would share an experience with you. I was in Kenya recently, and um, I was- Please uh, a speak a bit closer to the mic, especially since you mentioned Kenya. Sorry. A bit closer to the mic. Yeah. So, so we can hear you clearly. <laughs> maybe I just hold it. I think this is better. Yeah. So I was going to share an experience with you. So I was in Kenya recently, and I was in an Uber. So the Uber guy dropped me, and um, I paid him in cash, but he didn't have change. So he looked at me and said, do you have M-Pesa? Can I M-Pesa it to you? And I was like, no, I don't live in Kenya. I don't have anything to do with M-Pesa. Then it struck me, and it's like, why can't we, Africa-wide, have a coin or a token that obviously it's capped, maybe, a, maybe $25 um, dollars in terms of the cap that can go to a wallet. And when situations like this happen, I can easily get paid back by the Uber guy, for example, right? So it serves as an experiment, obviously, um, the cryptocurrency world, the token world, and all that is still quite new to Africa. We have to take one step at a time. So if we start with something like that, so which is like a cap, we use it for change, we use it for uh, very small things, then the three prongs that I see in this, which is the political side of things, the economic side of things, and the technology side of things, can have a case study that they can actually look at because we are experimenting and we can actually use that experiment to say, okay, it worked or it did not work. And if it does not work, we can roll back. If we keep talking about it and keep saying, oh, we want to adopt this, we don't want to adopt that, and we don't do something, then we'll still be stuck. We'll actually never move forward. So let's pick something that is small. Payment is obviously ubiquitous to it. Everything we do, we make payments both domestically, internationally, everything essentially that you do ends up being some kind of payment. So I see that as a low hanging fruit, but we can cap it, and based on that, we can obviously try experiment. Now, in terms of crypto or fiat, I will say that we still have the central bank for a reason, right? There's consumer protection, there's investment, investors protection, there's a number of things, right? I will be thinking that it makes sense to actually have a tokenized fiat. Let's see how it goes before we then say, let's then move to cryptocurrency. And there's a lot of education that needs to be done um, in the process, but we need to start small and then grow from there. Perfect. Thank you. Maybe just for context, uh, fiat currency um, legal tender whose value is backed by the government that issued it. For example, the dollar, euro, or uh, a few other uh, currencies as well. Now, the, international, uh, the chairman of the International Commission on uh, um, Law for Cybersecurity mentioned something yesterday that was pretty um, uh, clear that we, we were not taking account of. As we talk about a smart Africa, we also need to have a legal Africa. And the reality of things is, uh, since most of these things are new, there are a lot of loopholes in the legalities in some of the systems. So we end up playing catch up years after things have been implemented. So in that regard, now I come to you, um, uh, Thibault, to just guide us through what do you think are the risks when we're trying to adopt or adapt? And what do you think now you could possibly advise younger economies? Uh, Rwanda, for example, should be able to uh, be one of your clients to just guide them through uh, some of these uh, new age practices. Yeah, thank you. Can you, can you hear me? Sound is not that good sometimes. Thank you. Um, just for the sake of clarity for, for this debate, um, legally speaking, the issuance of a cryptocurrency as such is not a problem. You know, when you issue through a decentralized platform like uh, Bitcoin, a unit of exchange like, like, like the Bitcoin, it's, it's not an issue for a regular as such. You know, it becomes a problem when those Bitcoins are being traded using most of the time exchange platforms to finance terrorism or, to, or for laundering money. 
And that's the priority number one for a regulator. Absolutely priority number one is to regulate exchange platforms, as long as they are centralized themselves, because that's an apparent paradox in the blockchain environment, is that blockchain is decentralized, but the, the places where you trade afterwards the generated bitcoins by the platform are centralized. Some of them are becoming decentralized and they pose, uh, they pose a different problems in terms of regulation. But today, if you look at the African market, there are about 15 exchange platforms which are officially, let's say, located in Africa. None of them, as far as I know, are regulated. This is the number one priority. If you look at the United States or at the uh, European Union, uh, the first regulations affected uh, exchange platforms. And that's normal because it's the secondary market. Without the secondary market, you don't have real cryptocurrencies because they need to find a places to be exchanged and traded, right? Mm -hmm. And um, as long, again, as long as those exchanges are centralized themselves, because they are just websites operated by companies making profits on the trades themselves, they can be regulated. It's possible to regulate them. But you need laws for them. And in most countries, we don't have uh, the uh, necessary legislation to say those guys are like banks or they're like financial institutions and are subject to AML, KYC AML, the obligation to verify the identity of the customers using the platform. In most countries, it doesn't exist. If you don't create that environment, legislative environment, you will continue to evolve in uh, a situation where we will have a lot of distrust in uh, cryptocurrencies because you say, okay, around there, there are places where you can trade cryptocurrencies between anonymous people, maybe they read finance theories. It doesn't work like this. You need regulation for this. Right. The second priority, the second priority is the so-called ICOs, which are not secondary market. They are primary market because, and this is also a priority for, for the African um, uh, continent. You, are, you have more and more startups in Africa. They are being financed or trying to be financed by issuing their own tokens, right? So it's like their own cryptocurrencies. Most of the time they use either Stellar, by the way, or uh, the Ethereum platform using a specific token. And so they issue tokens. They are not issuing shares like in uh, any ordinary IPOs, let's say, they're issuing tokens. In exchange, they accept for selling those tokens, either Bitcoins, Ethers, more of the time, or just fiat, the famous fiat currencies, like local currencies. Those ICO issuers are not regulated either. And again, you can have some problems in terms of uh, AML, or money laundering schemes, uh, etc., or just disclosing information for the investors. Right. You are buying tokens. What, what are those tokens? What, what kind of rights will you get from those tokens? Why can you sell them if there is a promise for a secondary market? Where? What platforms? Under what legislations, right? Yeah. And you have more and more countries, and many in Europe. Europe is trying to find a balanced approach for uh, crypto regulations and you have no new legislation coming up. It's very important as well to have a clear framework for this. Mm. And my last point is the second problem for states or regulators when you, um, when you, you talk about cryptocurrencies apart from uh, money laundering and financial terrorism is a new competitor for your national currencies. It's not necessarily good perception by the banks or the central banks, so it's something new which is completely apart from the financial system, they cannot control, right? And so when you talk about a single cryptocurrency in Africa, you have first to break down the questions into different options. Mm. First, op to understand the debate. First option is, okay, we have Bitcoin out there which seems to become a universal currency. Is it the right currency for whole continent? And First question, you know, it's you can have different opinions on that, but you need to ask the question, is Bitcoin, which is universal today, adapted to a currency, a single currency in Africa? It's a question. The second option is to create a completely new global continental cryptocurrency. Okay, why? For reduce, reducing transaction costs, 
between African countries, maybe, like the crypto ruple, you know, that's the, that's the objective of the crypto ruple, reducing transaction costs between countries, right? Third option, third option is you don't create a new currency, you don't use Bitcoin, but you tokenize existing uh, national currencies. Why? You know, there are advantages. Why? Why? You reduce costs, you make it more transparent, more, um, more efficient maybe, but this is the third option. Wait. The fourth option, which is never mentioned, is to phase out that evolution in a more reasonable way might be to do something different. Would be to not tokenize, not tokenize the national currency as a start in the, in the very beginning, because here it's also about educating people and states about cryptocurrency. Maybe it's too harsh, right. too rapid to do so. Right. The, another solution could be to tokenize a state entity commercial debts into tokens, Perfect. right? So, and that's more reasonable approach. It's just a personal opinion, and there are some projects out there. Right, um, so we saw some of the panelists towards the end shake their head when you asked one of the questions there. Um, you wanted to counter with something. Okay, US dollars and euros fund terrorism and trade, and they also fund drugs. They fund 99.98% of the world markets in those. Bitcoin used to be used for those until the feds busted people. Now, very few people use anything with Bitcoin for the simple fact you have a digital signature. After Silk Road, the Americans went through all the logs and they arrested hundreds of people because there were signed evidence trails. If you digitally sign something, that's all they need to go to court with. Drug sale, done. Drug sale, done. Drug sale, done. No one uses it in their right mind anymore for that because it is a stupid thing to do. You are signing, I bought drugs, here's my receipt. That's why they don't do it now. So if you want to do a criminal activity and sign something saying, I'm breaking the law, use Bitcoin. Now, next part. I don't want an equal Africa. Equality, the way you're talking about, is called socialism. Socialism is screwed up and never works. I want a competitive Africa. I want countries that compete the hell out of each other, here and through the rest, people competing, because that's what naturally happens. People don't want to be equal. People don't want to be equal because the only equal is the lowest common denominator. There is one form of equality in the world, and it's called equally poor. I don't want a poor Africa. I want to see people work their way out of things by trading with the West and basically taking Western money so that they can do better themselves. Perfect. So there was a lot of eyes in the response. Let's just get the we perspective. Um, get the questions from the audience. And now, generally, uh, ordinarily, oh my word. We're not even gonna let us uh, create context. One, two, okay. So, but just keep in mind uh, the context of the conversation. Is cryptocurrency and African cryptocurrency what we need to be talking about? And what are some of the solutions that you think could uh, be worked on in your different countries? Because we know we have heavy representation in the room. Just feel, feel uh, as free as possible, but ask your questions as quickly as possible. 10, 15 seconds, or uh, 20 seconds, that's, then I'll, I'll cut you off. But kindly say your name and who the question is directed to. Uh, my name is, um... Hello? My name is uh, Rugigana, and uh, I work in the crypto space as well. And one thing that wasn't discussed here is uh, in America and other places, they're chasing uh, cryptocurrency companies out. And other countries like Estonia, Malta, Lithuania have you know, small countries without resources are bringing companies in. And I want to know from the panel, what do they think about maybe Rwanda or other countries, how they could attract cryptocurrency companies and bring talent here. And then that way maybe it diffused down by bringing the smart people, bringing the energy and getting some of those exchanges that bring tax dollars to the country. Is that a viable option as opposed to 
you know, I, I, I kind of see that as maybe the way to bring cryptocurrency here. But I don't know your thoughts. So, so I have a little bit of experience in this topic on the European side. Uh, when we formed Ethereum, we entered Switzerland. And at the time, Switzerland had no crypto. Can you guys hear me now? There we go. Okay, sorry about that. So I have a little bit of experience in this topic because when we formed Ethereum, we entered Switzerland as our HQ. And at the time, Switzerland had absolutely no cryptocurrency infrastructure. You talk to the Swiss and you ask them, Do you, have you heard of Bitcoin? And they say, oh, just what we've read in the papers. And it usually wasn't a positive impression. And just four years later, they're actually one of the most progressive governments in the world. They have notions of security and utility tokens. You could pay some fees in Bitcoin, buy train tickets with it. Uh, and there's a very strong cryptocurrency industry there. Well, why was that? Well, it's because the government was more than willing to have a dialogue with people in the cryptocurrency industry. The professional services were willing to engage with them, such as accountants and lawyers. And for a time, banking services were, I wouldn't say easy to get, but they were easier than, let's say, the United States. So uh, Rwanda has the luxury of being like Switzerland in that it's uh, small enough and agile enough that it certainly can create an incredibly friendly sandbox. But one caveat to this that all people who wish to participate in the cryptocurrency space are learning from Isle of Man to others is we live in a global marketplace. So even if you create locally a very safe harbor for businesses to operate, if those businesses are conducting global business, selling to US customers, European customers, Chinese customers, unfortunately they're still under US regulations and EU regulations and so forth. And they might not even be aware of that. For example, if you were to set up a company here in Rwanda and start an ICO and sell into the United States, you could be inadvertently breaking US securities laws. So that's the great challenge, is that it's not just like it used to be, like if you're in manufacturing or something and you say, oh, it's a great harbor for us to set up a hub and you'll pay low taxes and you know, get great cheap labor. Instead, it's a situation where no matter what the local government does, they're just one voice and a broader collection of voices. And so there does need to be some internationalization in the conversation about how these pieces fit together. I, I would Thanks, Charles. Can I add something? Say something? Right, and then maybe Dr. Monique as well, uh, maybe what the um, <coughs> prospects are to try and uh, bring in some of these investments into the country. Right? Can I add something? Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a very important point, just bouncing back with what just you said, is that the, the United States uh, and, and China are adopting an approach which is not very liberal towards crypto and ICOs. You and, don't say. And, <laughs> and the, Yes, and the, the European Union in that respect is, let's say, I'm European myself, so but more reasonable approach and, and could be a source of inspiration for the African continent. And uh, there are new legislations coming up in, uh, in Europe about crypto spheres, ICOs, exchanges, which are, I think, balanced and not a, you know, that wants stifle innovation and at the same time bringing the level of protection that everybody needs and uh, in terms, uh, notably, of anti-money laundering, etc., And um, the big difference, just to sum it up, the big difference between today, between US and in Europe, is that every time you issue a token in the US, I, I, I put it very simply, uh, every time you issue a token in the United States, you're going to be seen as issuing a security. So very simply said, very simply said. It's, it's, it's more or less exactly the opposite way in Europe. And when you issue a token, and the so-called utility token, meaning that the token you are selling to your investors are not generating as such profits or dividends based on the business of the issuer, but just the ability to consume a service that will be offered after the ICO and financed by the ICO proceeds, all right? And UT tokens are not securities in, in European Union, and that's valid for the entire zone of European Union. And, but at the same time, there are legislations we are coming up to protect investors. So it's not an IPO, it's something else that will be regulated, like in Malta, like in Switzerland, like in France, like in Estonia, and soon at European level. And so that approach, which is more liberal, but reasonable and protecting consumers at the same time, which is European Union approach, I think it's a good source of inspiration for Africa. Perfect. Law is law, code is evidence. There is no country on earth that doesn't regulate already. Bitcoin is money. It is always regulated. 
the argument that is total BS that people want to tell you is it's crypto, so it doesn't need to be specially treated. That they can go around and break the law, not pay taxes, not be regulated, issue securities and say that they're special. Guess what? Law is law. Full stop. Let me tell you something, Craig. Um, the issue with that, with that sentiment, though, is that different uh, countries in Africa are struggling with how to categorize it. If you categorize cryptocurrency as um, an asset, you can't tax it as such. If you categorize it uh, as a currency, you can. So that's where we are not on the same page. And you need to be very wary of how we are working on it uh, within our different borders. It's very simple. It is yeah. a currency. Right. It's not a currency. It's a commodity. Can I chip in? Yes, please. It makes yes. terrible <laughs> currency. It's as volatile as the Venezuelan money. Yeah, maybe to answer your question, Credit but also have work. a small question for Craig, if, uh, if you will. Yeah. Um, I think uh, to the point of um, the gentleman who asked the question, um, indeed, having a disposition to really engaging in a conversation and also involving the, 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 the financial sector industry uh, along the way, I think there is a lot for all of us to learn uh, about and also to make all the necessary steps uh, that um, we, we, we close the loopholes and uh, we, we raise awareness and uh, we, we, we make sure that uh, uh, consumers are protected and so on and so forth. So really that uh, is the way to go as far as I'm concerned. Really be open mm. to, to, to these new ideas. <laughs> uh, we can't pretend as the regulators that we know uh, the, 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 all the technicalities involved. Mm. And uh, having that flexibility as a regulator are really making sure you, you, you don't kill uh, that good or potentially good thing before it even happens. Mm -hmm. I think that's the responsibility we hold. And, uh, and um, uh, as Rwanda is concerned, we are, we are ready for that. And we hope that uh, the discussion is going to be shorter than, than, uh, than, um, than uh, this one. No, 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 no. <laughs> I, I'll say take shorter right. time. Uh, and not really drag, drag on. things. Right, drag on. perfect. Yeah. Uh, the small question for Greg is, um, yes, we are talking of uh, cryptocurrencies. Let's here really focus on the currency thing there in the cryptocurrency. Um, just maybe to educate me, because this is a, the opportunity I'm having to sit next to you, uh, the, 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 the really uh, expert person in this. Um, uh, we know that money, it, it, it's really backed by the real economy. Uh, it's production, yeah. because if you don't then make sure that uh, equilibrium is, 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 is held, then either you start to have a, a hyperinflation or inflation, moderate, or a deflation. So in this uh, context of, uh, of uh, cryptocurrency, so what is the backing of that? I'm talking now from the monetary policy point of view, and price stability and financial stability. Yeah, just if you could educate me more. It's back the same as any other currency, trust. At the end of the day, um, the US people trust that the bills will be paid. The US dollar is paid by basically treasury bonds being repaid by taxes. People trust that the economy is strong enough that in 10 years time, those treasury bonds will be repaid. They trust. That's the same with cryptocurrency. They trust someone else will take it in exchange for goods and services. Right now, it is very speculative. It is at a stage where most people don't use it as payment systems, where it's really a day trader jobber type environment where people try and flip it for a little bit more money rather than using it as money. It's a speculative asset. That will change. Now, I'm going to say something that most people in crypto hate. Central banks don't go away because of even Bitcoin. Nothing. I'm not a Keynesian, but I can actually create a Keynesian monetary policy using Bitcoin. In 1880 to 1890, there was a solid gold-backed 
pound. It was the strongest currency in the world at that point, and the British had their strongest growth ever. Over 12% per annum in a major country that was the centre of basically the known world. Like it or not, that was Britain. They had the biggest navy, the biggest everything. They had a gold-backed pound that wasn't a gold exchange standard. It was a true gold currency. Now, the thing is, they had a central bank. So you can't tell me that you can't have a pegged currency and have a central bank. You can. Back before Neo-Keynesian uh, sort of ideas and all the silliness that tries to explain it, Keynes actually said that um, governments in the good times save money. In the bad times, they spend to stimulate the economy. Why does that change? If you have Bitcoin, the government could basically save in the good times, actually build up reserves, show people that the reserves are there because it's transparent and open. Then in the bad times, when things actually do happen, because economies are cyclic, like it or not, not just because of banks, but because of disruption and technology, in those bad times, then you spend and you try and release things to the economy. So it doesn't change any of this. You keep getting all these developers who have no idea of economics telling you code is law, which is total BS. You have them tell you that it will change money and uh, banks won't exist. Wrong. You keep saying that it matters that governments can do whatever else and inflate. Governments want to control their monetary policy and they should, but at the same time it should be transparent. So the simple answer to you is, you can actually build a crypto-based economy. You can back it, you can peg it, and you can even have something that people can trade internationally. The gold standard worked before it was the gold exchange standard because British, Americans, French, anyone knew the value of exchange. Anyone here who's gone into Forex trading or actually engaged in international trade knows that they have to start doing things like hedging contracts. They have to pay the difference between their local currency and the foreign currency. They have to actually pre-do these things and there's an aspect of risk. Risk stops trade. Monetary risk stops trade. You want to be able to trade, and you can, if you can back it with something, you have a benefit. Right. Thanks a lot. Right. Um, I think we'll take three questions, and then we'll let, uh, let them answer. So where's the mi whoever is closest to the mic? Hi, everybody. My name is Tanodja. I'm from Senegal. I'm an entrepreneur from Senegal. Uh, I just uh, wanted to ask a question about volatility because when we talk about uh, Bitcoin and some other cryptocurrencies, we know that there are very volatile money. Uh, back to um, a couple of months ago, uh, one Bitcoin was worth uh, $20,000. Now it's uh, $8,000 or something like that. So how can we deal uh, with this vol volatility in order to use uh, cryptocurrency in a massive scale? Right, uh, it's been touched on just a bit, but um, hopefully he'll expand. Just hold on one sec, please. Let's get as many as possible. Um, that one will be answered. Thank you. Yes. Yes, uh, my name is Andy Letraide from Johannesburg. Um, it, uh, this should not sound like we are in an exchange, uh, currency exchange uh, session. The reality on the ground is that uh, currency is an exchange of value. And we know that the majority of population of people in Africa don't have value to exchange. So if you have value to exchange and you're worried about trading with someone in Dallas, then the fees and the decentralization make sense. What I would like to ask is, how do we use this opportunity for the majority of poor Africans that don't have access to quality education, don't have access to quality health, don't have a means of accessing technology, live in rural bases, have to survive every day just to put food on the table. How do we use this opportunity to, to, to rally and make a difference in them? Thank you. Perfect. Tunde, I guess uh, that's, that's yours. Um, next question. Hello. Okay. Um, my name is Shegun. I work for Card Programs International based in the UK. I think what I would like to hear from the panelists is really about the simplicity of blockchain or crypto. I think the average person finds it too complicated to get involved. And until they can get involved, there will be no adoption. And I think I second the motion about what uh, the gentleman here said about 
how does that technology apply to the common man? And I think if we can make it simple, easy to understand. If I get a gentleman from the village now, it will take me literally 10 seconds to explain to him what the Rwandan francs is and how he can spend it. If I have to explain cryptocurrency to him, it's going to take me maybe a day, maybe two days, maybe three. Because he needs technology behind it. He needs to understand what all the crypto keys mean. He needs to understand how to store it, how not to store it, how to exchange it. It's just generally very complicated um, for the average person. Thank you. Perfect. Charles, hopefully you'll take that one. Um, one, one more. Oh, okay. Yeah, uh, thank you very much uh, for the floor given to me. My name is Jean-Claude Rugubabuka and I'm uh, Rwandan. Uh, thanks re really for this discussion. Uh, mine is really quick. Talking of cryptocurrencies, we probably need to see uh, what kinds of cryptocurrencies should we adopt. I talk from experience, I have a group of students who are using a cryptocurrency called Steam uh, Sorry, with a platform called Steamit. Steam. Yes. Uh, these people, they are getting, you can call it free money. It is against the things they post online. Uh, we have a community in Rwanda and in Uganda. And, you know, as opposed to mining of Bitcoin, these people are posting their stories online and they get money. So let's uh, maybe look at how nationally and uh, on the continent, we can get the platforms that work for us. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, so, so four, I think we'll take five. There's, uh, the microphone is closest to, as it comes to the phone. It's the last one, then we just uh, answer the questions. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Osama, I'm from Egypt. Uh, I have a quick question. Uh, if we consider Bitcoin to be a currency and we would be encouraging governments to save in good times, at what interest rates are we going to be applying in case of uh, a use to try and manage inflation, for example? Thank you. Okay, my name is Linda. I'm a lawyer. I practice in Nairobi. My comment will be to governments, especially in terms of regulation. I think governments, especially African governments, spend too much time thinking about regulation rather than education. My advice, especially in terms of blockchain, will be that you will take this opportunity, for instance, and ask, um, for instance, Charles, and say, what commitment would you make in terms of educating maybe our citizens from Rwanda and Kenya to further this conversation and help developers, for instance, in Kenya, let them fund hackathons, for instance, find local solutions to problems that we already have. For instance, in medicine, how can blockchain further the conversation for, uh, for medical records, for instance, how do you help it? Um, in Kenya, the government spends so much time fighting M-Pesa, the central bank, for instance. They asked so many questions on M-Pesa, took them to court, and I think BitPesa had the same problems in Kenya as well. Please do not spend time fighting innovation. Spar up innovation, let, let there be a space and a safe place. Don't ask about gold, is it backed by any other thing? Give us the opportunity as young people to build, to experiment. We will make mistakes, but eventually we'll get there. I like the comment you made about a legal Africa. We have so many um, disintegrated laws, for instance, around intellectual property. I have to do something in South Africa, then I have to come and protect it in Kenya. Why can't you as government sit down and sort it out at the African Union and say this is our policy and direction that will affect the whole of Africa, rather than spend the whole time thinking regulation rather than innovation. Thank you. Hear, hear. Thank you. Thank you very much. I go. Right. All right. Um, thank Good you. Uh, my name is uh, Stona Twine, and uh, uh, I'm actually working on a blockchain project mm -hmm. called Eversend, and we are solving exactly Tunde's problem that he had in Nairobi where you could have a multi-currency wallet uh, <laughs> and pay Kenya shillings when you're in Rwanda, uh, quickly change it over into Rwandese francs, and possibly a token, again, based on uh, Stella. So now, my question, what I got from uh, the gentleman, the legal guy, I don't remember your name, uh, was uh, that 
currently, uh, from a legal standpoint, uh, it's okay for me to go and um, launch a token if I'm following anti-money laundering and uh, CFT rules, even if I don't have permission from the central bank. Uh, what's the position of the central bank? The question is directly to you. If today we launch a token that we sell to people in Kigali to solve a problem that is actually a serious problem, how would the central bank react? The reason I ask uh, this question is because this is exactly what we're going to do. You can't directly <laughs> ask the bank? <laughs> I think we'll start with the last question and then go in order uh, back. So would you like to address that? Oh, yes, uh, to address that. And uh, generally, the comments uh, on um, uh, policy and regulation versus innovation, and also way forward, because I'm more interested in the way forward. Right. Here we are talking of uh, this um, continental free trade area and we have to make it work as Africa. And uh, we know that technology has solutions to really improve on what we have today, which we know is not very optimal. We know that we still are dependent on the systems from other places through the corresponding banking and so on and so forth. So we have a responsibility as Africans and also as the citizens of the world to think uh, about a more efficient uh, system than what we have today. But still we have the responsibility of doing so in another manner. That's why there are governments. It's like no one can just do anything they want uh, without a framework. But the governments, I agree with the point that really stifling innovation is not the way to go for policymakers and the governments. Really, partnership, for me, is very important uh, because in the end of the day, when things fire back and, the, and, and um, some, some people lose money, then government is answerable to really protect the citizens. So that's why consumer education is important so that they know, you, the gentleman was saying, I can't explain Bitcoin and cryptocurrency to a normal Rwandan. So if then I can't explain in simple terms, then why should I really, don't I have the responsibility to educate, to provide information, so that uh, the, the person engages, like really they are, th there is no restrictions as to buying whatever cryptocurrency is here in Rwanda. You can issue them even tomorrow. What we are saying is, let's really expose knowledge to the Rwandan citizens so that they make choices. However, if you do like a pyramidal kind of scheme, that won't fly. Mm -hmm. Definitely that won't fly because the Minister of Trade is going to come after you. But if it's really something <coughs> that is really, uh, really for people to, 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 to support their exchanges and so on and so forth, I think, I think you, are, you are fine. So way forward, um, I wish we could really have uh, had more insights, especially for the benefit of the policymakers. What are the institutions we should really be seeing, really to take this uh, digital revolution forward? We are lucky to have our ministers of ICT here. Um, can we have a conversation uh, with the central bankers with the ICT ministers, the ministries of finance, uh, with the, I don't know, ministries of trade. Uh, really, I, I agree with the point that at the African Union level, we have really to do something that is coordinated and organized because I don't see really uh, um, the, the, the decentralization, which is really the key in these cryptocurrencies. If we, 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 we have, say, a thousand cryptocurrencies across Africa, are we going to solve the issue we are talking about here? I think we need some kind of synergies and convergence, uh, which is really coordinated, and uh, institutions that are, uh, are on the African continent, we need to start engaging in this discussion. Right. At least as central bankers, we have started, but I know that there is a lot more to be done by other institutions, yeah, but Really, that, that, that's uh, what uh, I think we have to do. And I would really welcome any insights as to what's next, what are the next things we should be doing 
at the African continent level if we are to really uh, advance uh, this right. agenda forward. Thank you. Um, there was a question that was asked on simplicity, but uh, so that we get that response, allow us to throw it to the Honorable Minister uh, from Cameroon, the Minister of uh, ICT, Libon uh, Lili Keng, to just give us maybe what's happening within the, uh, the states, within the borders. Uh, Honorable Minister, if you could just uh, guide us through what exactly is happening on that end. Uh, if you get a microphone, please. You had the... And then maybe, uh, Charles, you could take on the issue on simplicity. Sure. Um, I'm also going to speak in French. What I can say is that, um, no, it's not French, it's English. Je crois que ce que j'ai dit aujourd'hui, le sujet, c'est une crypto-monnaie unique pour l'Afrique en vue de l'intégration. Les discussions que nous venons de voir, vous voyez que la crypto-monnaie, comme c'est une plateforme déconcentrée, c'est les initiatives des individus. Et c'est comme si on veut effacer le gouvernement pour que les consommateurs, eux-mêmes, soient maîtres des échanges. Mais avant d'y arriver, il y a des dispositions que nous devons prendre. Donc, dans les différents pays, comme au Cameroun, on encourage. Mais la régulation, on laisse les individus, puisque la plateforme n'a pas de frontières. Si on trouve des partenaires de, à l'extérieur, c'est une expérience plus ou moins individuelle des petits cas. Et c'est les success stories qui vont pousser les gens à... La, le, le, à se l'approprier. Donc, pour le moment, ce sont des initiatives individuelles. Et je reste sur mon propos que quand on parle de l'Afrique, vous voyez ce qu'il y a à faire à harmoniser avec le niveau d'éducation, ceux qui sont instruits et ceux qui ne le sont pas. Et avec l'économie numérique, c'est tout le monde qui veut commercer. Donc, euh, moi, j'ai un petit problème. J'espérais et je souhaite que ces experts qui ont euh, intervenu disent à nous les Africains comment nous pouvons euh, euh, faire pour avoir une crypto-monnaie unique. En attendant qu'on encourage les initiatives et puis les success stories vont finir par s'imposer mais je rentre sur ma fin là parce que je me rends compte que ce n'est pas pour demain. On est à la libre circulation, libre échange et autres mais la monnaie unique crypto ou la vraie monnaie, la garantie. Et c'est compliqué, madame, le, 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 de, 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 la banque centrale vient de le dire. Quand ça marche, c'est bien. Mais quand il y a un problème, les populations se retournent vers les gouvernements. Voilà pourquoi il, on ne peut pas dire qu'on laisse faire comme ça, surtout quand on veut engager tout un pays. C'est ce que je peux ajouter. Merci. Right, merci, merci. Charles, over to you. Thank you very much, Honorable Minister. Thank you. Sorry, my French isn't too good. <laughs> um, so on the topic of simplification, uh, first I apologize, I, I don't have a wheelbarrow full of degrees, but I can teach people how to use digital signatures. Um, we at IOHK do teach people how to use cryptocurrencies, but we focus most of our educational efforts on developers. We've done this in Greece, we've done this in Barbados, and we just signed an MOU with the Ministry of Science and Technology in Ethiopia uh, to do it in Addis Ababa. Actually, requested the class be all women, and suddenly we had a lot more interest in professors wanting to teach the course. I'm not sure why, but uh, anyway, it would be a heck of a lot of fun to do something in Kenya. Uh, but in general, what I found is that the, the greatest conceptual sin that's been committed is you have this technology that's floating around the concepts of commerce and reputation and trust and coordination. And these are about markets, and these are about assets, and these are about choice and decisions. And getting those put together was time stamping and immutability and, uh, and auditability, and really quantifying who is actually in control. But unfortunately, the killer application that, was the, that brought this concept to the world was a currency or a commodity. There's certainly debates about that. 
So when people think about the underlying tech, they have a hard time decoupling it from the first use case of the technology. And they immediately compare a digital currency to their own currencies and their own experiences. And the reality is that consumer experiences are getting really good behind modern payment systems. If you look at Alipay or WeChat or you look at a lot of these modern systems, they're incredibly fast. I was just in Japan not too long ago. I was able to use my cell phone to actually pay for a cab. The first time I ever was able to do that. That was amazing. It was a great experience. So I think it would be counterproductive to try to encourage people to adopt cryptocurrencies, especially already distributed cryptocurrencies, because all you're doing is say, make people who are fabulously wealthy richer by you know, having this surge of retail people come in thinking they too are going to get rich. It makes no sense to me. Take a step back and look at their local problems. Like in Ethiopia, for example, we had a heck of a lot of discussions about coffee production because a million and a half people live in that industry. And we talked about everything from how do you create incentives to stump trees, which over the long term dramatically increase production, but in the short term cost you money because you lose the production of the tree while it's being stumped. <laughs> or how do you get better rates from washing stations or find which washing stations actually have the best rates. These are problems that are intimately familiar <clears throat> with people. And if you sell them the tech this way and show how it can reduce waste, fraud, abuse, or improve that supply chain, and make trade easier for them, then it's not too conceptually hard to then extend it and say the same thing that makes your coffee good can make your voting system or your property ledger or even your money itself good. So I think that's really the key, is to, to localize it to the experiences that they're used to, have a dialogue instead of telling them you know everything and uh, you're, you're a genius. Instead, just say, hey, teach me what your problems are and have some form of a feedback loop where you're able to trade. Right. Uh, and over time, things will look good. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Charles. I'll take that as your parting shot as well. Tunde, uh, over to you. There was a question on uh, value exchange. Maybe you could uh, couple that with um, what kind of crypto. Uh, the gentleman at the back asked uh, what kind of cryptos we should be looking at. Okay. And Thanks. your parting shots. Yeah. So I, um, in terms of you talked about someone that is local, how does he actually benefit from crypto? The way I see it is, there's a lot of conversation about, as an example, the engine of a car. You keep trying to explain the engine of a car. The best way to get you to appreciate something is take you in, first of all, create a car, take you in a ride in the car, then you start to appreciate it. So my point in saying that is this. For someone who is in a local community, if you bring a solution that addresses his needs and is based on crypto, blockchain, or whatever, he would obviously resonate with it. It's like m in Kenya. You don't have to explain m too much because it's solving problems for people there. So the key is, like, Greg had, um, like Charles. Charles had said, is really knowing what the local problems are creating a solution for that problem, and people will adopt it, and also engaging the local people, because they know their country, they know their problems. You can't parachute a solution from outside and expect people to just accept it. So that's um, how I see it, it's get to the root of the issue. Right. Um, then education is obviously important, but education has its place because no matter how, like my example about the engine, no matter how much you explain an engine, it's better to show and then let them use. The second question um, you talked about is in terms of what crypto to adopt. I still am a firm believer that it should be a tokenized fiat. The reason why I say that is they still need for control. What we are trying to solve here is Africa doing business with itself. That's the crust of the issue. How do we go from that 10% to maybe 50%, right? So if we have something that works for us within Africa, we strengthen ourselves, then we can then compete with the world. If you go and compete with the world right now, just as a small nation, you get slaughtered. Right. Why don't we first do business with ourselves, get stronger, then we can then go out and look at the world and then compete. That's what China did. They got stronger. That's what the um, Asian Tigers did. Get stronger domestically, then you can go compete with the world. That is my take on it. Perfect. Thank you. As he wants. Just give us your last words, maybe sentiments on the same and your parting shot. I would like just to say that I'm very optimistic. 
I'm very optimistic because if that whole thing works, it's going to work for everyone. You know, if you look back in time, times in history, in known history, where um, there was what there, there was a lot of prosperity were the times of the great pyramids and the great cathedrals in Europe. Why? Because there was then a dual <coughs> monetary system where you had at the same time a currency which was used by kings and emperors to, uh, uh, for their um, exchanges with their neighbors and local currencies being used by uh, by people f just for exchange goods and services. And the coexistence of both systems, both types of currency, brought a balance to the system. And that's exactly what's going on now with cryptocurrencies. If do not just focus on national cryptocurrencies, but also to more decentralized local uses of those currencies. Because both systems will reach out to a certain a certain balance. ICOs, that's the good aspect and the, the positive side of ICOs. Many of them will fail, like any startups. But the phenomenon of ICOs is meaningful, especially for Africa, because it brings new types of units of exchange in circular, circular economies. And if you look at certain countries where local currencies, which are not national currencies, are being used, they brought prosperity to poor people, to very poor people. You know, when a florist doesn't have m enough money to go to the restaurant, and, but if I can use a cryptocurrency that would be accepted by the restaurant owner, automatically you increase the power of those people to purchase goods and services without having the need to get uh, no sh uh, national currencies. It makes a huge difference. Right. So in that respect, I'm very optimistic. Thank you. Craig, uh, there was a question on volatility, interest rates, uh, managing inflation. Of course, you've touched on it, but uh, just give us that and your parting shot. The simple word is derivatives. Like every other currency, you can hedge, you can set up options, you can do all these things, you can make smart contracts. And as for things like interest rate, well, there's nothing stopping that, but interest rate is taking a hammer to a patient who needs a scalpel. It's well known in uh, the last 30 years of uh, monetary policy that it's a terrible, terrible way of actually managing things, and even the um, uh, American government don't really do that anymore. Now, where we're talking about things like trading in Africa, people don't trade in Africa because what is there to sell? The world wants your goods, but opening up to second layer development and actually having things that people want matters. This idea, rah, rah, let's sell in Africa, sounds wonderful. I'll tell you it's BS, because quite frankly, Singapore, mosquito-filled swamp, started trading to the world, big now. Japan, backwater nothing, traded to the world, big now. England, a backwater bit of nothing, opened up trade to the world, and became the global empire. And only fell apart because they decided they needed to actually put armies everywhere and become an empire instead of a trading system. The Brits fell apart because of that. When you start thinking that this is about trading, opening up the ability to trade, that's what matters. I sort of piss off a lot of people because I don't like people like Gandhi and whatever else. Gandhi came out and told the Indians how to be self-sufficient, basically taking their own com uh, country and saying that they could all do things inside, they could all do it in their region. He told people how they trade with a surplus with England and all the English give them is money. Guess what? Money allows you to buy goods and services. After that, the economy crashed. 20 million plus people starved to death because women having to work at home making cloth, the removal of factories, the removal of global trade killed it. Nike, people pick on them. Why? Because they pay 280% of the global local wage and have people in the areas that are still there lining up for up to four years for jobs. 
And we in the West like to sit there and go, oh, how terrible, these poor people get paid too little. Except they get paid much, much more than they would have. And because of that, Nike's now moving towards lights out factories where they don't hire anyone anymore because of the BS about, oh, these poor people, these poor people who now put their children through education. And that one is critical. Not in all these silly degrees that we see out there right at the moment, so we can get an arts degree in... Uh, Harvard now has one in scatology. Right. In math, science, etc. A quick point. Yeah, Dr. Craig, I don't think you have any idea of what happened in the 19th century in India. So, please. Yeah. So, uh, I don't believe minute, you were alive then either. Yeah, just a minute. Right. Uh, uh, I, I, w I would imagine Mr. Gandhi was not an economist, but for you to tell that 20 million Indians died because they, weren't, they could have been paid more, etc., women were working, please. Okay, you don't have any clue. Actually, I've studied all of that. I could tell you the history of India, Nauru. I could tell you the, um, the change from when um, the different uh, parts of the Dutch uh, company came in, let's, the let's British, try whatever yeah, else. Yeah, yeah. So, you don't have any clue, please. Hold on, hold no, on, of course sorry. not, because focus, it's lovely focus to say the socialism works. Market. Is there any way to just lower the mics for everyone? <laughs> right. Um, so, uh, please, please, allow us to get the last, the last word uh, from uh, uh, the Deputy Governor, please, to just finalize this session. We have a lot. We could go on and on, but the session has to stop for the next one uh, to continue. Kindly give us your parting shot. Yeah. Sorry? Yes? Hold on, hold on. Hold on, please. That, that will get into another session. Hold on, please. I think we had agreed that we are going to respect each other on the panel, and uh, we are going to stick to that, uh, and, uh, and it closed nicely. Mm. Um, I'm glad we are having this conversation, and we are having it here, in this very place where we, a few days back, our heads of state have really made history by signing the Continental Free Trade Area. And I hope we are going to, to really further this discussion. It shouldn't really die or be just the Transform Africa 2018 thing. So let's really create uh, spaces for really continuing this conversation because we are seeing that we still have um, some, some, some distance between different positions, but uh, we all have an interest that some convergence right. yeah, be, be gained sooner than later. And uh, as I, uh, I kept saying, here in Rwanda, we are really ready for that. And we hope that we continue engaging this discussion at the continental level, yeah, so that at least we see um, uh, clear on how we can be fast on really finding a solution for, for, for the Africa. And like the minister said, yeah, in the meantime, yeah, people will keep innovating. And as they innovate, and uh, ideas will keep coming. And eventually some, some equilibrium will obtain. I think that's right. what I yes. heard from... General from sentiment. Yes. Right, thank uh, you. And uh, we thank you for, for this opportunity. Uh, no, thank you. Study. Thank you very much. Uh, for, uh, please, just a warm round of applause to the panelists. Um, of course, the general sentiment is uh, on uh, a bit of structural change or behavioral change or awareness on the same. We have some underlying issues that need to be addressed uh, before we get to full adoption of some of these ideas, let alone the cryptocurrencies themselves. So this conversation doesn't end here. Uh, but um, just a quick question. For all of you who've stayed through the entire time, uh, by show of hands, how many of you have, are getting out knowing a bit more than what they came in with? Right. All right. Um, Follow-up question. How many of you would actually invest in cryptocurrencies, given the information you found in the room? All right. That's pretty reassuring. Uh, pretty reassuring. Although, it's, uh, I will tell you, full disclosure, this is the only session I've never had so many, uh, the word BS be used so many times. 
But I will tell you that uh, I told you at the beginning that we needed to have some uncomfortable uh, conversations to have a comfortable uh, future later. So uh, hopefully we'll engage as we continue. So again, Dr. Monique and Sazabaganwa, our Deputy Governor, uh, BNR at the National Bank, the Central Bank of Rwanda. Uh, Craig Stephen Wright, a Bitcoin expert. Of course, we'll leave the, le uh, the rest, otherwise we'll get into another conversation. Uh, Charles Hoskinson, a CEO, IOHK at the extreme end. I'll say the two of you together because you're the ones handling the digital offerings. Uh, Tunde Ladipo, VP for Partnerships at Stella. And of course, uh, Thibault Vibiers, uh, partner, DS Advocates, uh, telling us the legal perspective. And I've been your moderator for today, George Nirango. Please feel free to engage them as soon as they leave. Maybe not to the same level, but just engage on what exactly is, as uh, Dr. Monique said, is the way forward. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks, everyone.